I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Scripture to 2 Samuel, the very last chapter, chapter 24, the very last verses there, verses 18 through 25. Second Samuel chapter 24, beginning with verse 18. That day Gad came to David and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite. Following God's instructions, David went up as the Lord had commanded. When Araunah looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming toward him. And Arana went out and prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground. Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, so that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arana gives to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God respond favorably to you. But the king said to Arana, No, but I will buy them from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being. So the Lord answered his supplication for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God... May we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we will do what you call us to do. So we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You heard this story before? Right? Probably probably not. Probably read over it just real fast. It may be the oddest Stories you've never heard from the Old Testament. In chapter 24 of 2 Samuel, David, the king of Israel, decides to take a census of the people in his kingdom. Now, we're not really told why he wants to take a census. Some have speculated it was so that he could brag about how much the kingdom had grown. Some think, well, maybe he wanted to impose a tax Some say, well, maybe he just thought it was the kingly thing to do. We don't know why he does it, but what we are told is that because he does it, God is angry with Israel. So much so that David's seer, his prophet Gad, comes to him and lays before him three choices. God's going to punish Israel, but David has got to pick how. He can either have three years of famine... Three months of running from enemies or three days of pestilence. David gets to choose. Now David has to decide if he wants three years of famine. And in that time, people will stop uh, blaming a God they can't see and start shaking their fists and pitchforks at a king that they can. Or he can choose three months of being chased by enemies. You don't have to read much of the Psalms to figure out not really David's favorite pastime. Or three days of sickness on the whole of the kingdom. David chooses option number three. So we're told in chapter 24 that for an appointed time, the people are plagued with this illness. And and at the end of this time... 70,000 people have died. The angel of the Lord, uh, the sort of embodiment of God's destructive judgment, has stretched this pestilence, this plague, all the way to the place that would later become Jerusalem, in Jebus. And there he stops. 
The angel stops, we're told, by the threshing floor of a Jebusite named Arauna. A threshing floor was the place where they would go and, and beat the wheat upon a stone or on the floor and, and separate the wheat from the chaff. Now David in this time is begging God to end this judgment, end this punishment on the people. Just blame me and my family. Bring it on me and my father's house, David says. And in the wake of this pestilence, in the wake of God's punishment for this census that David has, has, has taken, the prophet Gad comes back to David and tells him this time, All right, you are to erect an altar to Yahweh, an altar to the Lord. And guess where he wants him to do it? On the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite. A site that tradition says would later become the place where Solomon would build his temple. This is where our text picks up. David makes his way to the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite, meets him there, and David tells him, I've come here to buy this place to buy this threshing floor in order to build an altar to the Lord so that this plague may be inverted from the people. And Harana, however, is a generous man and, and maybe a frightened one and, and perhaps has no doubt witnessed this pestilence and now has King David standing in front of him. He says to David, Let the Lord my king just take it. Take what offering seems good to you. He even says, here's some oxen, take these. Uh, uh, here's the, the wheat rakes and everything else. You can break them up. Here are the yoke, that, uh, keep the oxen together and burn them for wood. All of this, he says, O king, I give to you. David had come to buy the threshing floor and this man just gives it to him. Here, take it. Here, king, take it. Here's the threshing floor and all that I've got. Just take it. I give it all to you. Isn't that nice? What a wonderful gesture of devotion. Or maybe it's a gesture of self-preservation and fear. King shows up, says, I want it. Okay, here you go. David comes to buy this place, and this man just wants to give it to him. I can honestly sit here and tell you that has never happened to me. I don't know if it's happened to you. I don't know about you. I've never walked into the showroom of the dealership only to have the owner come out of his back office with title and keys in hand and say, here you go, buddy. It's all yours. Take it. Never happened. I've never went to a realtor with a realtor to look at a piece of property to make an offer only to have the seller counter and say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the whole land plus a year's worth of lawn care for free. It's never happened. Never happened to me. So what a gesture from this Jebusite, right? To hand the place over, to give up a portion of his livestock, his tools, to watch them burn simply because the king needed them. Now maybe there's a lesson there. But that's not the lesson or the point, I think, of this part of the story. Because you see, David could have used his power as king to intimidate this Jebusite and take the threshing floor. I don't know, I might have done it. I might have shown up and said, all right, you may not know me from Adam, but I'm David. And I'm sure you've heard about David and Goliath, I'm that David. When I was a little boy, I cut a giant's head off and killed him with a slingshot. I may have even brought the one and just swirled a little bit. Like, hey, hey, I need this land, right? I may have done it. He could have used his, his role as king to intimidate him. He could have declared eminent domain, come with a, a parchment in hand, right? Rolled it out and said, this private property is needed for the public good, so we will be seizing it on behalf of the nation of Israel. Or David could have just taken the Jebusite up on his offer. You're going to give it to me? Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. But David doesn't do that. Instead, this is what the king says. I will buy them from you for a price. And this is the sentence. This is the word that catches me. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. I will not offer to the Lord my God that which doesn't cost me a dime. David refuses to take the threshing floor, the oxen, the implements. He refuses to take them for free. He refuses to take them without paying for them, not because of pride, not because of the legal ramifications, not because he does not wish to be holden to some Jebusite. So later on, he can come and say, hey, king, remember, I gave you that land. Pay up, pony up. It's time to return the favor. That's not why he does it. 
David won't take it. David pays for it because he simply cannot offer something to God that didn't cost him anything. If only, if only all of those who call on the name of the Lord had such a conviction. You know, I can't think of a single thing in my life worth having that hasn't cost me something. Not a single thing in my life worth having that hasn't cost me. I mean, naturally, there are those things that have costs uh, because they have a price. Sometimes written with washable marker on the windshield. I remember it. It said 4,500 low miles. The sky blue Chevy S10. I just wrecked the immaculate Tercel that I had built. If you don't know what a Tercel is, just take time right now, borrow a smartphone from somebody, look up a, a, a 91 Tercel coupe, and imagine me <laughs> driving that thing. Okay. But I remember, I saw it. Sky blue, beautiful little pickup. I drove that thing all through college, all through seminary. It was the first car, first debt really, I had ever completely paid off. I remember the relief, the joy, the sense of accomplishment I had when I walked into that lobby of the Citizens Bank and Enterprise and I walked up to that counter and I opened my checkbook and said, how much do I owe you? I wrote that last check and that teller said, congratulations, Mr. Thomas, it's paid in full. If I wasn't a Baptist, I'd have danced out of the lobby. <laughs> that little truck moved me back and forth to Sanford more times than I can remember. I have a bookcase in my study at home. I built just so it would fit between the fenders of that truck with the tailgate closed. I moved that Moved back and forth many times. Uh, we loaded our stuff in that S10 and put it on a trailer as we drove from here to Texas when we first got married. I helped countless friends move from dorm rooms and apartments. It hauled everything from books and bookcases to old cardboard boxes for a homeless ministry and groceries when we first got married. It was a great little truck. One worth every single cent it cost me. Of course, there are those things in life that seem to cost us long after we thought we've gotten our use out of them. Those things for which the bills come due each and every month. Sally and I are closer now than we've ever been to paying off our student loans. Thankfully, we had no graduate debt, but boy, we had some undergraduate stuff. And every month, when I get that little email, that little notification that this amount has been withdrawn, although I, I don't usually cuss, I don't, I don't always threaten the all-powerful Sally Mae with prayers of computer crashes and complete file losses, though it would be nice if they would miss ours. No, instead, I at least try to be grateful, not only for that degree that hangs on, on the wall in my office, but for the experiences we've had, the places we've been, the friends we've made, because every dollar in tuition, room, and board, or books that I paid were not just for the degree, but for the memories and the experiences. And they've been worth every single penny I've borrowed and scraped and every penny I'm with repaying now, even with interest. I think of the homes that we've rented and the one that we're buying now, how much each of those rent and mortgage checks were and can be still difficult to write, especially when there's life to be lived, vacations awaiting, new experiences to have, when there's always that looming threat of more month at the end of the money. I think of how much each of the places we've called home has cost us. But then I think of the memories made in each of those places. Like Sally's first attempt at making divinity in our little apartment on MLK in Waco. I think some of it is still stuck to the cabinets today. <laughs> I think of the parsonage we rented from Spiegelville Baptist Church in Waco and how, how they would invite us over each year for their annual fish fry. How Irby, one of their deacons, would come over and cut half of my yard every time he cut the churches of how we would go for walks in that community when they had their annual big yard sale. I bought my copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin in someone's driveway there. I think of our rental house in Anniston, where I learned that cockroaches come in all shapes and sizes. 
where we would go for walks in the afternoon in some of those old downtown neighborhoods. I think of our first home in Weaver, first house we ever bought, and I don't want to say joy, but the experience of sitting down at a table for hours and signing my name over and over and over until it's no longer recognizable. We brought our little dog Nikita home there. We would host Bible studies, youth groups, friends in that little house. Of course, I can't help but think of our home now. It's where we brought Cole home with its nearly deceased appliances. Sometimes we have to turn the stove off at the breaker box. Sometimes the dishwasher makes the plates dirtier, but that's okay. (laughs) With its stained carpet, its warped deck boards, it's where we play together, it's where we laugh together, cry together, watch way too many episodes of Paw Patrol together. And even with all of its warts, with the warts of every place we've ever called home, every rent check, every mortgage check we've ever written has been worth it. Every single one. I can't think of a single thing. This is not in the text, sorry. I can't think of a single thing in life worth having. Any experience worth sharing. Anything worth my time, my energy, and my love. That hasn't cost me something. And friends, I'm going to tell you, that's most especially true when it comes to my church, my life of faith, and my relationship to God. After all, what in the world is worth more than that? I mean, really. Who in this world, after experiencing the loving, powerful presence of God, I'll trade it for anything. Just over a week ago now, my ritual these days, if you want to call it that, when I come into the office, I put my backpack down, I take out my laptop, I, I get things ready, and then I, I pick up the little, got a little desk calendar, and I peel off a page. It's a Star Wars desk calendar that Peggy gave me, which, this is not in the text either, is worth every single cent we put in the plate. <laughs> Peggy is what you should applaud that. Peggy is worth every single cent you put in that plate. Okay? But I peeled off September 14th, and there it was, September 15th. The 15th of September in 2002. That was 15 years ago. That was when I was baptized. Sorry, I'm just trying to catch my breath. Uh, I've been baptized now, a baptized believer. For a decade and a half. And at that time, I have have sought to follow Jesus the best way I know how. And I think I've come so far, but I know I've got a long way to go. I haven't always succeeded. I'm a far way off from where I was 15 years ago. In fact, 15 years ago, I probably would have called myself a heretic. But no matter what it costs me, and every single second on the clock that I've spent in service to Christ, every single inch I've traveled in pursuit of Jesus, every cent that I've spent for the work of His kingdom, every single one of them has been worth it. Every time I've sat down to write a check to this church for the kingdom work we do, I know it's been worth it. And I know you have too, even even if you don't feel the same way, because I've seen the difference it makes in the lives of those, not only those that we give food to once a month, not only those who who, who are recipients of the ministries that make the papers, but I've seen it in, in the lives of those who need a place in a community that welcomes them no matter who they are or what they've been through, even if we disagree with them, even if maybe we don't even like them at first sight. I've seen it in the tears of those who've needed a place to say goodbye to their loved ones, surrounded by even more people who love them more deeply. I've seen it in the way this church rallies to meet needs when they're expressed, the way this church has stood in the face of criticism for doing what is right, the way we've partnered with unlikely friends to do God's work. I've seen it in the ways we share in one another's struggles with life, relationships, 
and the ever-changing realities of culture around us. Every time I write FBC Williams on a check, whether I put it in an envelope or place it in the plate or, or send it on, whatever, every time I write that on a check, it costs me something. It costs me money. Money I might use to pay off that student loan debt. Money I might use to buy replacement appliances or new tires for my truck. Money I might use to boost our adoption savings. Money I might use towards a more secure retirement, a more elaborate vacation, or a nice dinner out. Money I might use for any number of other things. But I know whenever I write that on that check, whenever it costs me money to give to God and the work of God's kingdom through this church, it is a cost that is worth every single cent and more. David said, I will not offer to the Lord my God that which cost me nothing. He said it because God is worth something. This church, this work to which Christ has called us is worth something. It ought to cost us something. In fact, it's Jesus himself who says to those who wish to follow him, those who wish to become his disciples, he says, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, none of you can be my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. In other words, Jesus doesn't say, you can't be my disciple if you only give the tithes. You've got to give it all up. And it's something I'm working on each and every day. So what if following Jesus, what if calling ourselves Christian, what if this whole thing we sometimes call church, what if all this is actually supposed to cost us something? What if? What if it costs us everything? I think of the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that great theologian of the last century. He says this, God's grace is costly, because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, and it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it's costly because it costs God the life of His Son. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. What has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. As we continue to look forward, as we celebrate our achievements of the past, our faithfulness, as we continue to pray and dream with one another, may we not grow complacent with where we are now. May we not give in to the temptation that this life of faith is cheap simply because God's love is free. Together, Let us commit ourselves to one another in our shared mission as Christ's church by giving to the ministry of this church. Our ministry to one another. The ministry we share together. May we echo David's words with our life, with our giving, and commit to say we will not offer to the Lord our God that which costs us nothing. May we be reminded of Bonhoeffer's words about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus, that what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all else, when we ask, what if it cost us something? May we be reminded of the call from Jesus to take up our cross. May we be reminded that indeed it does cost us something. It cost us everything. Because this life that God gives us, this life of faith that calls us on into the reaches of eternity, is worth everything. It's worth everything and so much more than we could ever hope to give. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, when we take we take this life, this calling, this church for granted. Help us, God, to see that you call us, you call us into this work 
and it cost us something. Lord, we are thankful that your love and your grace is free, but that in accepting it and seeking to follow you, Lord, it cost us our lives to give up all of who we are, all we hope to be, Lord, that we may seek to be all that you call us to be. So Holy Spirit, be with us in this time and in this place. Speak to our hearts as we continue to worship together. Lord, show us, show us those places, Lord, where we need to, to give more over to you, to let go, to know God. That this work, this life, this joy, this love you call us to cost us something. Be with us, we pray, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.